Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so um, I'm going to be talking about types, as, uh, as, as many people have before me. And uh, this is a subject on which Luca has written pioneering original research, uh, and also some, some beautiful surveys. In fact, this one, uh, I think, is his most cited paper, has already been, been mentioned. Um, so there are lots and lots of different accounts of what types mean and what they should be for. Uh, and um, I'm going to talk about the best one. Um, and, uh, and the best one is the one that Pierre-Louis has, uh, has already mentioned. It's this idea of, uh, of interpreting types uh, as, uh, as binary relations. So the story is we're going to start with some universe of, of, of untyped computations. Um, and then we could carve out the meaning of a type as a subset, a set of values um, in the untyped world which have that property. But we're actually going to do something just a little bit more subtle. We're going to interpret the type as a binary relation. And you should think of this binary relation as carving out a set of values that have that type and a type-specific notion of equality on those values. So our primary, the primary subject that we're interested in is this judgment that says uh, m equals m primed at type a, not m has type a, m primed has type a, and they're equal, um, but they are equal at that type. And the kind of most important part of the definition of this kind of interpretation of types is the clause for, clause for functions, which I guess everyone's seen many times before. So it's a standard logical relations definition. It says two, two functions are related at type A to B if whenever you give them uh, A-related arguments, you get back B-related results. So, um, so our view is very much that the computations exist beforehand and then types are going to be properties of those programs. So lots of people have studied this kind of thing uh, in the context of, uh, of, of polymorphic lambda calculi. So uh, the understanding of, of parametric polymorphism, the free theorems, is, is understood by quantification over relations which go beyond these uh, equality-like ones. But the, um, the emphasis uh, in a lot of the early work was on finding good models for pre-existing pretty lambda calculi. Um, we have a slightly different viewpoint, which is we're interested in using this technique to reason about messy, dirty imperative programs uh, and about properties which are perhaps non-standard types. Um, so they might not have such pretty rules. So we're going to take uh, the, the truth about imperative programs first, and then we're going to try and impose some discipline on it via this, uh, via this methodology of, 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 of using logical relations. So the first thing that, uh, that I ever did along these lines is something that's very, very simple. It arose from some dissatisfaction I had with the accounts that people uh, uh, gave of um, traditional data flow optimizations uh, in, uh, in imperative language compilers. So, uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to do something like whole logic. So whole logic says this command takes state satisfying a precondition uh, P to a postcondition Q. And instead, we're just going to sort of crank this up to reasoning about pairs of programs and related states. So the judgments we're interested in is C is related to C prime at phi to phi prime, where phi and phi prime are binary relations on the states. So this means that if you start C and C prime in states that are related by phi, then either they both diverge or they both terminate in a state satisfying uh, in the relation phi primed. And you can give quite nice rules uh, for... Um, for standard imperative programming constructs um, that reason directly with relations over the two heaps expressed in terms of a language where you label the variables with one or two according to which side they come from. And um, as an example of the kind of thing that you can do with this logic, um, here's a judgment. This is a, a, an invariant code motion, plausible pro optimizing transformation for a compiler to do. We notice that uh, this assignment to x uh, assigns a value that doesn't get changed in the loop, so we can pull it outside the loop. And so you can use the logic to prove that these two programs um, are related at phi to phi, where phi is the relation that says the variables i, n, and y are equal on both sides. And the thing I draw your attention to uh, is that this, these programs are not contextually equivalent in general. Okay? So if the loop's not executed at all, then the assignment doesn't happen on this side. So they're only related, they're, they're only equivalent, if you like, in contexts where we don't care about the final value of the variable x. And that's exactly the kind of information that an optimizing compiler needs to do interesting transformations. So simple though it is, this logic is pretty, is pretty useful. Um, it embeds a whole bunch of traditional data flow analyses. You can do some forms of secure information flow and program slicing. And it gives you the corresponding optimizing transformations at the same time, not just soundness of the analysis. 
Um, so lots of other people have taken this up and done fancier things with it, in particular for security. So there's a whole bunch of, uh, uh, of, uh, of more sophisticated versions of this logic which build probabilities in and so forth, which have been used very successfully in, um, in verified crypto protocols and so on. And I should mention that the inspiration for doing this in the first place came from this paper which has already been mentioned, Formal Parametric Polymorphism, a paper by Martin, Luca, and Pierre-Louis, which, which kind of introduced the idea that you could have a formal calculus for reading, reasoning about, about relations. So the second thing I want to talk about is models of ML-like languages. So it's the same technology, but used for something different. So ML has higher order functions and dynamically allocated local references, and this is a tricky combination. The, um, reasoning about programs in that language is actually quite hard. Um, so here's a, a trivial example of the sort of thing that goes on. Um, we've got two functions. So this, this computation gives you a, assigns a new reference, gives you back a function which decrements the reference and then returns the negation of its contents. This one, new reference, gives you back a function which increments it and returns the contents. And so these two things are contextually equivalent in ML because the reference X is hidden inside those two closures. Nobody else ever gets to see it. And the external behavior when you make calls to the two things uh, is the same. But um, we have to think about how we prove these sorts of things. And the picture you should have in your head is something like this. So at any point as the program executes, um, there's some bunch of references that have been created with some state which have not been exposed to the outside world. So they're private to, to the closures. And then there's some bunch of references which are public. They've been handed out to the outside world. And the point is the outside world can do anything it likes with these things. So for two programs to be equivalent, they have to be very equivalent on the stuff that they hand out to the outside world because the outside world can prod it. But on the private stuff, you can have a more general form of invariant. So if we were going to think about two program executions and whether or not uh, they were going to give you uh, equivalent results in all contexts, well, it suffices to have some setup like this. So you've got the two bunches of private store, which are possibly different, but there's some relation between them. And then on the public parts, there's some correspondence between the references which have been generated. And if all the computations preserve this relation on the private store and this correspondence between visible references um, uh, is preserved in the sense that there are always equal values in, uh, in the corresponding references, then the two things will be equivalent. So we can formalize this by what's called a Kripke logical relation. So we're going to interpret types as relations again, but now they're parameterized by the, this pair of things, some invariant on the private store and some partial bijection, some correspondence between the references which have been made public. Now, I apologize for the slight excess of formalism, but basically there's a, there's a, there's a relation on heaps which just says what I just said in that picture. So, so two heaps are in the relation at r and phi just when they're related in r and then on some separate part um, for all the, all the locations which are in correspondence to phi, they have equal values in. So it's just a separating conjunction of, of a relation and, um, and then equality on phi. And then the interpretation of int type is just in, each integer is equal to itself. The interpretation of our reference type, two, two, two locations are equal at the reference type just when they correspond in this phi. So it's, this, this parameter comes in and tells you, in this world, these are the references you should consider equivalent. And then for function types, again, it looks big and hairy, but it's a very standard pattern. It's a normal Kripke-style thing. It basically says, if you've got two heaps that are in the relation at the parameter, and you've got two arguments, which are in the argument type at the parameter, then there's some extension of the parameter, that means adding disjoint relational stuff and disjoint bijection stuff, such that when you run the two commands, uh, the two functions on those heaps and arguments, you get back things which are in the relation at the new extended uh, parameter and return values which are uh, in the interpretation of the return type at the extended parameter. And you can prove the normal fundamental theorem and, you can, and, and then you can also show that when things are in the relation at the empty relation and, um, and, uh, and parameter, then they're contextually equivalent. And that gives us a method of proving um, contextual equivalences like this. Okay, so second thing, very closely related again, semantics of effect systems. So ML has complicated um, equational theory. Um, lots of equations you'd like to hold don't actually hold in general because you don't know that things don't have lots and lots of side effects. Most ML programs don't have lots and lots of side effects. So what you want to do is crank up your type system to track a safe upper bound on the side effects that things have. So if you know more about the possible side effects things can have, you can prove more equations. And this is the kind of thing that you get. This is an effect system for a language uh, uh, expressed in terms of index monads. So, so instead of having 
T for a computation of something, we have T sub E, sub epsilon rather, where epsilon is going to be an upper, is going to be a, a set of effects, and I read some variables, I write some variables. So if you dereference a, a location L, then that's a computation that returns an integer and has a, an effect of reading location L. If you assign to V, assign to V to L, then that's a computation that has um, a side effect of, of writing um, location L, and when you sequence computations, you union their effects. So we built an ML compiler that did optimizing transformations based on, on using a type system like this, um, but we wondered for quite a long time uh, what it actually meant and how we could formally justify what we did with it. And so the way we do it is we, we give a relational interpretation again to these refined types. So we start with the semantics for the, for the language before we did anything fancy with the type system, and then we interpret the refined types as relations over um, the interpretation of the unrefined types. So the meaning of a effect refined computation is a binary relation on um, the, uh, the unrefined thing. So the unrefined thing is going to be a function that takes an input state, gives you back an output state, and some element of the underlying type. So we have a binary relation on there. And the binary relation that works is, is, is like this. So, so this says two computations are in the relation at an effect type t epsilon of x just when they preserve all relations. So the start mean r related states, I'll give you back r related results and um, and meaning of x related, sorry, r related final states and meaning of x related uh, final results for all relations in some class. So this is bounded quantification over relations. And what's the bounded quantification? Well, for each primitive effect, we have a set of relations um, that are preserved. So the set of relations associated to reading L is a set of relations such that if you're in the relation, then uh, S of L and S primed of L are equal. And the set of relations associated with writing a location L is a set of relations such that if you're in the relation and then you update location L with equal values, you stay in the relation. And what we do is we take the set of effects E in epsilon and we intersect all the corresponding sets of relations. That gives us um, a set of relations and then the computation has to preserve all the relations in that set. That was a bit quick, but the slogan, what I just said, all amounts to this, you have to preserve all the relations that are preserved by all the operations that you're allowed to use. And it turns out this semantics has fundamental theorem, but it also gives us, on, off the diagonal, these effect-dependent program transformations. So we can prove the optimizing transformation that our compiler does on the basis of this relational interpretation. So here's an example. It says you've got x gets m, y gets m in n. So we evaluated m twice. That's the same as evaluating m once and using the value twice provided that the collection of things which are read by the, uh, by the expression M and the collection of things that are written by the expression M are disjoint. So this works very nicely for global variables, and we can combine it with what I had on the previous slide uh, using partial bijections and private invariants and so forth to extend this to uh, a more realistic effect system that deals with regions and dynamic allocation. So final thing I'm going to try and cover. Um, so, so this, this, is, this is something about proving that compilers preserve types of the source language. So we start out with a simple functional language compiled down to an idealized assembly code, and we interpret the types of the source language as binary relations over the assembly code. So this is basically the same story as was on my first slide, types as relations over an untyped model, except here our untyped model is uh, real, real assembly code, um, not, uh, not sort of abstract uh, untyped functions or codes for partial recursive functions or anything. So source types interpreted as binary relations, they only talk about the observable behavior at the outside, and they define the calling conventions, but they're independent, they don't mention the particular compiler, they just talk about the interfaces of things. And we can then give a compositional proof that the code produced from a source phrase uh, is related to itself at the relational interpretation of that type. And the way we do that is use a relational separation logic for assembly code. Yep, okay. Okay, so this is a, this is a, this is a separation logic version of the relational logic that I talked about um, earlier on. And um, to, uh, to exp I, I won't show you the cock, but to explain what, what that what that uh, theorem really means, just consider we all draw these pictures of what happens, what the memory layout looks, in, uh, looks like in, a, in compiled code. And um, basically what the relational interpretation of types does is it tells you, for example, where I drew a pointer here, none of the code cares what the actual value stored in this cell is. It, its behavior will only depend on what the value is at the other end of the pointer. So we're quotienting the memory to get this picture, and that's what the relational interpretation of types gives you. So we have two other 
applications which I don't have time to talk about, one of which is doing full functional correctness of a compiler, and the other is cranking up the effect system to talk about abstract data structures instead of concrete locations in the heap. But I will summarize by saying the relational approach is a powerful, elegant, and effective way of timing, taming side effects. I will draw your attention to the fact that I didn't instrument anything. There's no talk about going wrong here. And so two slogans. So all type systems are about information flow. They're all about how much difference makes a difference, if you like. And this slogan about preserving all relations, preserved by all the operations, I think is a very valuable one. It's something I've been using logical relations for a long time before I realized that was what we were doing all along. Um, and uh, I'd like to um, encourage you to, to take the semantics first. So view your syntactic types as an interface language for components, but then you can show that a piece of code matches that contract, matches that interface by lots of different methods. It might be a simple type system or it might be a complicated logic. And finally, happy birthday, Luca. <laughs>